Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia here on Ngunnawal Country for today's Westpac Address. I'm Kath Sullivan, the ABC's National Rural Reporter and also the Acting President of the National Rural Press Club. Our guest today is Andrew Campbell, the Chief Executive of the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research we might refer to it as Asia uh, forthwith, who will be speaking today about Australia's role in feeding the world. Uh, Andrew was recently appointed as the Interim Executive Managing Director also at the Global Organisation Overseeing uh, Agricultural Research Centres and can perhaps tell us a little bit more about that. You can join in the conversation on Twitter today. Our handle is at Press Club Australia or using the hashtag NPC. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Campbell. Thank you, Kath. Dawuru Nuna, Dawuru Nunawal, Yangu Nalawili Dunimanyan, Nulawalwali, Dawuruwari, Yingara Dindi, Wangalari Jinyan. It's a pleasure to be here on Ngunnawal Country and I acknowledge uh, the Elders and also acknowledge any other Aboriginal people watching today. Thanks to the National Rural Press Club for hosting this event and uh, especially to Cathy Reid from the Crawford Fund and Eleanor Dean and her great team for the excellent organisation. I would also like to acknowledge the presence here today of senior members of the Diplomatic Corps ACR Commission Chair Fiona Simpson, Commissioner Tony York, and my successor as ACR CEO, Professor Wendy Umberger, whose appointment was announced by Senator Wong yesterday. Congratulations, Wendy. <laughs> You've just landed the best job in Canberra, if not Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge senior leaders from the public service, the science community, ACR colleagues and friends and family. Thank you all for coming. The late, great John Kerrin once told me that there are only two types of speech speeches worth listening to in Canberra. The maiden speech of members and senators and the valedictory addresses of outgoing departmental secretaries and agency heads. <laughs> The former gives you the most unvarnished perspective on why that person entered politics and the values and aspirations that drive them. And the latter offers hopefully some hard-won insights and reflections from people who are no longer worried about the next Senate estimates hearings. <laughs> In this talk, I hope to share some lessons over the last 40 years, working across policy, management, research and education in the fields of sustainable agriculture and environment. And I think my colleague Andrew will be giving a similar address for IPA next week and I'd thoroughly encourage people to, to uh, get to that. For those with short memories, here are five takeaways from this talk. If humanity is to thrive this century and bequeath a viable planet for our grandkids, then the world needs to produce more and healthier food, shared more equitably, grown much more efficiently and sustainably, while using fewer resources, land, water, nutrients and fossil energy, and polluting and wasting far less. Australia has deep and broad expertise in the sciences needed to achieve this. We can play a vital leadership role in this region and beyond. Foreign Minister Penny Wong, my boss, has argued eloquently that Australia could be more effectively deploying all the tools of statecraft in a more joined up way. Science and education partnerships are a strategic tool of statecraft and expression of soft power. ACR has demonstrated this time and again over the last 40 years, albeit at modest scale. To have durable influence internationally, we need to walk the talk at home. This will require innovative policy and thoughtful strategic building and in some cases rebuilding of institutions empowered to take a long view. The benefits of proactive leadership are compelling and the costs of business as usual are stupendous. The window for effective action is narrowing rapidly and the costs of the sluggish myopia of recent decades are blindingly obvious and escalating. Before substantiating these points, 
a brief bi biographical detour. This is not the reflections of a seasoned Canberra Mandarin who's spent decades in this town. My eclectic career has been punctuated by slices of extraordinary luck and serendipity. In 1977, when I was doing my HSC in Hamilton in Western Victoria, Dad told me that crook wool prices meant that if I wanted to go to uni, I'd have to fund it myself. My grandfather saw an ad in The Age for scholarships to the Victorian School of Forestry at Creswick. And I applied because I thought working in the bush sounded good, having grown up at the foot of the Grampians. And I was fortunate to be awarded what even then was a very rare bonded studentship offering full board and accommodation and tuition and a guaranteed job at the end if you happen to graduate. I really enjoyed several gung-ho years working in operational forestry, building roads, fighting fires and advising farmers on farm trees. Then at the age of 24, I got kicked in the ass by a rainbow again and was seconded to be project manager of the Potter Farmland Plan. This was a $1 million investment by the Ian Potter Foundation establishing demonstration farms. It was the largest uh, example of environmental philanthropy in Australia to that time. It was high profile. We were on ABC Countrywide, the precursor to Landline, several times and we hosted thousands of visitors to those farms. In early 1988, by sheer coincidence, I, in the same week I hosted visits from two VIPs. Rick Farley, Executive Director of the National Farmers Federation, and Philip Toyne, Executive Director of the Australian Conservation Foundation. Two great leaders, sadly both no longer with us, who both became close friends. They had identical reactions to what we were doing on the ground. This is terrific, how do we scale it up? I told Philip that his reactions were the same as Rick's and that they might have more influence if they started working together. Toyne just smiled at me and said, we already are. To cut a long story short, I was drafted in as an independent member of an informal ACF NFF working group with the late Jane Illix of ACF and Philip Elliason of NFF. We wrote a proposal to Bob Hawke for a community-based national land management program worth $340 million over a decade. At that time, the total budget for the National Soil Conservation Program was a million dollars a year. So we were proposing that the Commonwealth have a radical expansion of its involvement in natural resource management, which at that time was seen as very much just the province of the states. We entered the PM's office with some trepid trepidation, but Bob Hawke agreed to our joint proposal instantly. As we were leaving, Toyne said, I think that went well. And Farley grimaced and said, shit, I knew we should have asked for a billion. <laughs> Rick Farley was the most authentic leader and the most strategic political operator I've ever known. His sudden death in his early 50s was a tragic loss for this country. And I often wonder how Farley today would hand, handle the rancid polarisation of what passes for a lot of public policy debate. Bob Hawke launched the decade of land care at the junction of the Murray and Darling Rivers at Wentworth in 1989. The then shadow minister, Bruce Lloyd, was on the podium, along with the ACF and NFF and others. Can you imagine today launching a new environment initiative with a decade of funding with the government and the opposition and all the competing stakeholders all on the podium. This reflected the bipartisan convening power of the NFF ACF Alliance and more particularly the leadership of Farley and Toyne and the personal trust between them. I was appointed to a newly created role of National Land Care Facilitator with unusual reporting lines to Rick Farley, Philip Toyne and the then Minister Peter Cook, uh, who later uh, it was John Kerrin and then Simon Crean. From 1989 to 92, before email and before mobile phones, let alone social media, I did more than 200 tours to every part of the continent, looking at land care on the ground and reporting direct back to the Minister, the NFF and ACF. By the middle of the 1990s, Two out of every three Australian farm families were involved in land care. There were land care and water watch programs in every state, uh, in every primary school, and they were core parts of the curriculum in every jurisdiction. 
There are diverse care groups and watch groups in the cities and along the coast, as well as in traditional farming areas. That role taught me more than anything else. I learned from Toyn and Farley about the power of partnerships and the political potency of unusual alliances between stakeholders who normally disagree, but can put areas of disagreement aside to work together in the national interest. I also learnt from them and John Kerrin that if you want to change policy or shake things up, then timing is everything. Of course you need good content and good arguments, but the best proposal in the world will disappear without trace if it lands in the political mix at the wrong time. And from Rick Farley I learned that when the time is right, go big. Be ambitious. Incrementalism can't get us where we need to go. After four hectic land care years, I escaped to the Netherlands to do a master's and wrote a book on land care. Then I ran out of money and returned to Australia in 1995. Five years as a bureaucrat in the Environment Department was followed by seven years as Executive Director of Land and Water Australia, then four years running my own consultancy business, then almost six years as an academic at Charles Darwin University. Darwin was something else, the most distinctive capital city in Australia by a mile. It was a great insight into the challenges and potential of Northern Australia and of working with Indigenous people on their own country, but also of the frustrations of academia. By late 2015, I was more than ready to come back to Canberra and when the job as CEO of ACR came up, I went for it. The Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research is a wonderful example of a well-designed, fit-for-purpose institution. A statutory authority that has served the foreign affairs portfolio, the Commonwealth and the national interest extremely well since it was established by the Fraser government in 1982. The basic value proposition for ACR was set out in an industry uh, commission paper in 1976 by Sir John Crawford. And that was that Australian agricultural science could be useful in developing countries to help them increase food production and reduce poverty. The world has changed since then and improving food security is more complex than just increasing production. But I think that proposition is even more valid today. Over the last 40 years, ACR has brokered, managed and funded influential science partnerships. Research funded by ACR has underpinned new industries worth billions of dollars a year, delivering better livelihoods to hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers. Our partnerships have improved biosecurity in partner countries to the significant benefit of Australian primary industries and rural communities. ACR-funded research is helping partner countries to manage land and water resources more sustainably, improving their own food security and empowering women and girls. More than 800 scientists across our region have received ACR-supported scholarships and fellowships that have benefited their careers and developed their leadership and management know-how. Many of these people are now in influential leadership roles across the region and they feel a deep connection to and affection for Australia. I'll never forget one night at an alumni dinner in Ley in uh, PNG. One of our John Allwright fellows, so PhD scholar in Australia, said simply, ACR is the best of Australia working to help its neighbours. Our work is uncontroversial. Julie Bishop used to say, your work's so safe. <laughs> um, it's valued by a wide cross-section of society. Partnerships between research organisations and between individual scientists often span whole careers and they're characterised by deep mutual respect and reciprocal obligation. An Australian ambassador in a partner country likened ACR has building critical ballast in the bilateral relationship. Strategic, targeted, valued, stable work that operates effectively under the radar and steadily accumulates goodwill and influence, irrespective of the static and the volatility of bilateral and multilateral politics that our DFAT colleagues have to deal with on a daily basis. I could spend the rest of this talk talking about wonderful projects ACR has delivered, but I don't need to because hot off the press, literally today, we're launching this book and all of you who've made the effort to be here today can take one with you 
at the end. It's a fabulous book on 40 years of ACR structured around people, partnerships, projects and places. This is tremendously rewarding work. But from my 40 years in research, extension, education, consultancy, management and policy, it's glaringly obvious to me that it's not enough. Collectively, we are doing too little, too slowly, too partially and too timidly to tackle the obvious challenges that have been well understood by scientists for decades. We're going backwards. It's always a dilemma how to present the depressing statistics about what I call the converging insecurities. Food security, water security, energy security, biosecurity and health security. Noting that COVID-19 is just the sixth zoonotic pandemic since 1980, not a one in a century event. These intersect and interact with each other in complex and often unhelpful ways. And all of them are amplified by climate change, the great risk multiplier. Together they feed into national, regional and global security risks through forced migration and conflict over land and water resources. The state of food, new, food security and nutrition in the world, 2023, big new report, was published last week by the FAO, the World Food Program and the World Health Organisation. It shows that 29% of people on earth are food insecure and 11% are starving or severely food insecure, exacerbated by COVID and the war in Ukraine and of course global heating. As many of you will know, the first week of July was the hottest ever measured and almost certainly the hottest on Earth for at least 100,000 years. Of Florida right now, at five foot depth, the sea temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Sea surface temperatures in the Arctic, the new record is further from the previous record than that record was from the mean. Sea ice extent in the Antarctic is five standard deviations below the mean. That means that absent climate change, the natural probability of that event would be one in seven and a half million years. On the third pole, the snow and ice caps of the Himalayas, a recent ISIMOD report two weeks ago assessed that glaciers are melting much faster than we previously realised. The glacier melt from 2010 to 2019 was 65% greater than it was from, 20, uh, from 2000 to 2009. So the rate of loss is increasing. Now this is the watershed for more than 2 billion people. Glaciers play a crucial buffering role and their loss will mean much more volatile conditions downstream. The floods that we saw in Pakistan are just uh, a small indicator of what's to come. Also more severe droughts and it seems that peak water will arrive before 2050 and after that we'll have a drying scenario. This has huge implications for global food security and especially in our region, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Available fresh water per capita continues to decline, deforestation accelerates, and bigger, hotter fires in new places are making things much more difficult. So the science is very clear and the evidence is in our faces. And we know what we need to do. Electrify everything, shift to renewable energy, use land, water and nutrients far more efficiently, radically reduce waste and protect and restore nature. There is some positive news. The IEA uh, reports that in 2023, for the first time, it looks like emissions from electricity will actually go down. Not just emissions intensity, but aggregate emissions. Emissions intensity is declining in the transport sector too, albeit too slowly. But the agri-food system is a huge challenge. That's the third biggest sector of emissions and our emissions are increasing. If food waste was a country, it would rank third for global emissions behind China and the US. Food production and processing uses around 70% of diverted fresh water and it's the biggest driver of deforestation. Methane is an acute problem for the agri-food sector. Because of its greenhouse potency, 
It doesn't matter what we do to CO2. If we don't get methane under control, we cannot meet our global targets of two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. It's great that Australia has joined the Global Methane Pledge and that industry is proactive in research on ruminant methane through Meat and Livestock Australia and partners. But this needs to be even more ambitious and we need comparable research to eliminate fugitive methane emissions from gas operations and from landfill. Australian farmers and rural communities should be net producers and sellers of energy, not price takers. The global debate on livestock and meat consumption, for those who follow it, is incredibly frustrating, usually lumping everyone in together. A Maasai cattle herder, a Pakistani family with a few goats, or a Timorese farmer with a handful of pigs, bears no comparison with a 10,000 head Kansas feedlot producing hamburger meat using feed grown on land cleared from Amazon rainforests. In the countries where ACR works, livestock provide vital protein for humans, they're culturally and economically vital, and their emissions are trivial compared with high input intensive systems in rich countries. We need a much smarter debate. Having now spent 14 years leading Commonwealth statutory authorities, I've experienced firsthand the value of having specialist agencies with statutory independence deep expertise, long memories, complementing the work of departments of state. ACR is highly effective, credible, much loved across our region, steadily accumulating goodwill, the ballast that that ambassador referred to. I don't think it's coincidental that in 40 years, ACR has never been mogged. There's a Canberra verb for you. It's never been renamed, restructured, repurposed, or shifted to another portfolio. At various times and places, Australia has implemented, in my view, all of the pixels for the world's best big picture for managing natural resources sustainably. But patchy, brilliant innovation has been accompanied by institutional amnesia, ad hocery, and inability to stay the course. Too often, a change of government, a change of minister, a razor gang in a tight budget, has led to worthy initiatives being discontinued, useful organisations being abolished, or unproductive churn as initiatives are rebadged, reorganised and relaunched with significant transaction and opportunity costs. No wonder episodes of utopia are triggering for so many people in this town. <laughs> Robust, long-term approaches to water, carbon, biodiversity and climate change necessitate robust institutions. In my career, just in my own space, I've seen the abolition in the mid-1990s of the Energy R&D Corporation, Land and Water Australia in 2009, the National Water Commission in 2014. These were all very useful statutory bodies doing important long-term work. Our institutional architecture is much the poorer for their loss. We've also seen the demise of non-statutory valuable initiatives like the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, which did fantastic world-leading work sector by sector on climate change adaptation. Had it continued, I think we would have been much better prepared in places like Lismore, Mallacoota and Kinglake. Over a spate of scarifying recent Royal Commissions, we've seen time and again the need for more robust, independent, expert in, uh, institutions with a clear focus on the long-term public good and national interest. We seem to have lost the muscle memory for effective regulation, for timely and well-targeted compliance and enforcement effort, for independent umpires with teeth and the courage and resources to use them. Australia has led the world in many areas of natural resource management, not least in designing new markets for water and for carbon, and now flagging possibilities for biodiversity. But if we don't have similarly world-leading measurement, monitoring, audit and verification systems, backed up by effective independent regulation and adequate compliance effort, we'll see distortions and inequities in these markets, information asymmetries, a lot of subprime carbon, and ultimately ongoing environmental degradation and pollution. 
the credibility of such markets is brittle. The late Will Steffen used to say, you cannot decrease emissions while increasing emissions. In 2023, we're still increasing emissions. We can't offset our way to two degrees, let alone 1.5. The only KPI that matters is whether pollution is being cut at source and how fast. At the risk of straying outside my lane, if, I haven't, if I'm not well and truly there already, <laughs> I'd like to conclude with potential ideas, uh, ideas about potential initiatives here in Australia that with some tweaking could also shape science and policy partnerships across our region. All countries in our region are grappling with the shared challenges of feeding their people more and healthier food, more sustainably, while decarbonising and coping with much more volatile and extreme weather. Australian science and policy innovations can be influential well beyond our borders to a much greater degree than they are currently. So-called soft power, I hate that term, can be highly strategic, improving regional and national security here and now. It would be timely to rejuvenate land care with associated citizen science and schools programs, making much greater use of digital media and cool new environmental monitoring tools, much cheaper and much more uh, uh, accessible than anything we've had in the past to foster constructive community engagement in environmental repair, circular economies and renewable energy. We published this book last year on lessons from land care across more than a dozen countries. And there's a principle woven through this book called subsidiarity, a governance principle that decisions should be made at the most appropriate level, usually the, most, the lowest most practical level. This seems even more apposite as we confront ever more extreme events where centralised, top-down approaches are often found wanting. The Lismore floods are a classic example. With the SES headquarters underwater, a community Facebook page became the coordinating mechanism for an ad hoc flotilla of tinnies that rescued many people off their roofs, saving many lives. We should explore how more distributed, self-reliant, community-based networks can actually be the default emergency system, not having to be magicked up in real time, because we know centralised systems will probably fail. Doing this work in Australia would be incredibly relevant right across our region as man-made disasters become more and more frequent and intense. A DFAT-funded and DAF-supported international land care program for food security and climate resilience could foster people-to-people -people links between Australian land care groups and their counterparts in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Of course I'm biased, but in my view this is a no-brainer. Good environmental policy essentially boils down to trying to influence behaviour so that pollution, destruction and degrading activities become less attractive and incentivising more sustainable and regenerative activities. Juicier carrots, smarter sticks, clear targets, rules and guardrails, transparent monitoring and enforcement by independent expert bodies. Unfortunately, current policies in many countries do the opposite. A recent analysis, global analysis of agricultural subsidies worth 550 billion US dollars uh, each year undertaken by the World Bank and the International Food Policy Research Institute, found that 87% of these subsidies are counterproductive. They actually work to increase emissions, increase degradation and exacerbate social inequity. Less than 30 cents in the dollar of that $550 billion of agricultural subsidy gets to farmers. Repurposing those subsidies into measures that improve sustainability and resilience represents a very exciting international agricultural policy agenda in which Australia could play a leading and influential role. We have so much to offer the world. But to be credible, especially as we seek to host a COP, we need to have a hard look in the mirror. Are we still subsidising emissions? Are we propping up high emitting sectors? 
Are we overlooking sleepers like fugitive methane from fracking operations? The big challenges I'm talking about are all international and cross-sectoral. Accordingly, the science needed to tackle them is an international enterprise, necessarily collaborative, multidisciplinary and participatory. That's something that Australia actually does very well, especially in agriculture, environment and health. We've had to innovate to prosper on our ancient depleted soils in a highly variable climate. Our scientists are very used to working with farmers and industry in partnerships thanks to our rural R&D corporations and our cooperative research centres. As a middle-sized country, but with great technical depth and breadth, we have more convening power than we realise. I would love to see Australia leading big international missions in applied research for development, tackling these converging insecurities across our region, playing a convening, brokering and partnering role. This would reflect the Minister's desire for Australia to deploy all tools of statecraft in a more considered, integrated way across governments, industries and communities. Foreign Minister Penny Wong recently approved an updated ACR 10-year strategy that foreshadows new transformational research initiatives and more ambitious partnerships within Australia and internationally. This provides a fantastic framework for my successor, Professor Wendy Umberger, with the great ACR team and partners working with Fiona Simpson and the Commission to build on that 40-year track record in a new era of Australian science partnership in our region. Australia is well positioned to build on this platform, leading and working with our neighbours to tackle the most pressing challenges of our age. Thank you. Andrew Campbell, is it time to panic? <laughs> well, whether it's time to or not, Kath, it's not a very productive activity. Um, no, we, we just need to work harder and smarter. And, uh, and we have all the tools and we have all the know-how. Um, we need to understand that there are powerful vested interests in favour of the status quo, and we need to crunch through that. Has that changed over your time in the role? Uh, has what changed, sorry? Well, both the, the interests, the invested interests, but also your, I guess, optimism or thoughts about some of the challenges. I, I guess you, you might pick up um, from my talk that I'm, I'm increasingly frustrated. And, but you're smiling. And uh, <laughs> because, because the window is narrowing and the longer we take and the slower we respond, the more expensive it's going to get and the more compromised will be the bequest for our kids and our grandkids. And so that's the frustration. And for many people in the scientific community, they sort of oscillate between despair and, and, um, and hope we do need to figure out ways of increasing momentum very substantially. We could see in COVID that we're able to do it when we had a burning platform. And the trouble with climate change is that it's, it is every bit as burning a platform, but it creeps up on you more slowly and across a broader canvas. So yeah, we don't have a choice, we have to. And I guess I'm asking you to reflect on your time in the position. Um, obviously, your frustration has grown, but what sort of response are you encountering from both the community, governments, policymakers about your concerns and, and the plight that you've highlighted today? Um, we get a fantastic response from speaking with an ACI hat from our, our partners in, in partner countries obviously from farmers that we're working with and industry uh, players that we're working with and policy makers too. Uh, and, and certainly, um, uh, you know, there's enormous scope here and the Minister has approved our new strategy that says we want to scale this work up. And, uh, and so certainly in my discussions with Penny Wong, she completely gets it. Um, so I'm confident there'll be, uh, you know, that 
the direction is right. It's about how fast and how far we go. I want to come back to the, the methane in a moment, but we will open for questions. Um, Mike Foley is from The Age and the SMH. Thanks, Professor, and I'm um, from the National Rural Press Club as well. Um, thank you for your uh, frank address. I, I'm going to draw on um, some comments that uh, John Blackburn has made repeatedly. He's, you know, chair of the Institute of International Economic Research. He's a former deputy chief of the Australian Air Force as well, and he's been warning uh, for several years that there are uh, growing impacts of climate change across our region are uh, a huge concern in terms of food production in the region and he's warning it will drive uh, conflict, instability, people displacement across the region and of course you know that's that's going to hurt um, our, our neighbours in the region and will also uh, materially impact Australia as well uh, as you as you've outlined Professor but um, Given, given your remarks uh, about valedictory speeches providing the unvarnished insights, um, in the spirit of the late, great John Kerrin, I'd be asking you to dig deep, draw on that again. <laughs> so what's Australia doing wrong? What, what can Australia do better to address the, the pressing problems in our region um, from those issues that, that uh, John Blackburn's so concerned about? Um. Well, uh, I think as I outlined in my talk, I think we have the scientific know-how, we've got fantastic scientists and research organisations and the ability to work effectively overseas, so we could be playing a stronger and more proactive leadership role in our region. Um, just take an issue like um, the Supreme Court of India recently decreed that farmers should stop burning stubble. Uh, they burn their rice stubble, so they can put in the wheat crop. Well, CSIRO, with support from ACR, invented a new cedar called the Happy Cedar, which can actually help them to do that. And they've sold 20,000 of these things in the Punjab in just the last few years since the Supreme Court made that, that decision. Australian know-how helping India solve a problem and grow six tonnes of wheat in a rice stubble uh, with that technology developed in Australia. I could give you a dozen examples like that, that we could be progressing far more aggressively than, than we are now across Eastern Africa, South Asia, into Southeast Asia. Fantastic tools for more efficient irrigation, um, terrific um, uh, ways of ensuring that all the fish in the Mekong, which provides 60% of the protein, can get upstream through dams and irrigation weirs. At the moment, they're trading off their energy security for their food security. It's Australian know-how that helps them to get around those problems. And we could be much more aggressively um, pursuing that and investing a lot more in it. And in my view, that aid investment is not a humanitarian play to help out poor people in poor countries. It's a highly strategic investment for Australia. Uh, that plays very well for our, our own security. Levels of people moving uh, are going up. Forced migration is on the rise from places like Yemen and, and, uh, and the Horn of Africa, and we're going to see a lot more of that. Our work is actually preventative if we get it right. Thank you. Jamison Murphy. G'day, Andrew. Jamison Murphy from The Lands. Um, Thanks for your speech, it was fabulous. Uh, you mentioned the need for effective regulators. I just wanted to ask you about the APVMA. Um, Australia really relies on its clean and green image, uh, having high standards and effective regulators. Um, there's a lot of questions over the APVMA's effectiveness at the moment. Um, I, the, some people have suggested that that will affect our international reputation. And given your expertise and the circles you moved in, I thought you would be one of the few people really qualified to weigh in on that question. Sorry, mate, that's way too far outside my lane. Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not at all qualified to talk about that. It is, does, how much does Australia's reputation rely on its high standards uh, as a trading to nation? To a, a very significant degree. I mean, uh, the broader point which I made is that um, 
the way in which we have tried to design and establish markets for things like water and carbon, the way in which we've tried to share the water of the Murray-Darling Basin across boundaries, this is looked at very carefully by countries in our region. There's six countries in the Mekong catchment from China, you know, uh, right down. And so they look very closely at what we're doing here in Australia and, and we are seen as leaders, but we do need to make sure that we're walking the talk. Yeah, so just on that, from, a, again, a broader perspective, understanding your constraints, um, if our own standards on specific issues, regardless of what they are, if they're not up to scratch, is that uh, taken notice of by the international community, particularly when we're trying to help or impose these standards on other nations? Yes. Any, is that, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Nice and succinct. Uh, Simon Gross is from Canberra IQ. Uh, um, I'm going to drill down to a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a particular project, uh, Fall Army Worm. Um, Australia has recently accepted that Fall Army Worm is here to stay and we've got to deal with it. ACR is doing um, a research project in uh, Zambia on fall armyworm, uh, looking at uh, uh, a fungus, a naturally occurring fungus, and a, um, uh, a virus. Um, to what extent is your project in Zambia informed by what's going on in research in Australia and vice versa? And what prospect do you... Uh, 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 how do you foresee the, the battle against Fall Army women both here and in a place like Zambia? Am I allowed to phone a friend, Kat? <laughs> uh, There's a few in the room. <laughs> my colleague, Dr Eric Hutner, could give you a, an extremely scholarly answer to that question, Simon. Um, but but because, of, because of Eric's expertise, I can assure you that, that there absolutely will be a, uh, a good exchange of knowledge between what we're doing in Africa and what we're doing in Australia. Okay, well, while we're getting the mic for that, okay. Yeah, sure, let's, let's have Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Eric. Um, now, that, that was unscripted and unprepared. <laughs> good day, Simon. Hello. Okay, um, there's an Australian company which developed the virus. Yep. So it's a commercial product uh, available to Australian growers. So it's a GM virus or is it? No, 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 no. no. It's, um, it's a virus that's pathogen for the insect. Okay. And it can be produced and it's produced in Queensland, I think. And so all our project is doing is trying to see whether we can get villagers in Zambia to produce the virus themselves. And the same with the uh, entomopathogenic fungus, the metarhizium strain. Um, the key issue to understand in, in that context is that the first answer of people, even poor people, to the devastation of fall army worm is to go and buy a can of chemical. Mm. And some of those are benign, some of those are very dangerous, mm. many of them have big impact on biodiversity, etc. And so the biological control is an option as long as you can provide it effectively to people who need it. And that's what this project in a very modest scale is trying to explore. It's a research project. If we are successful in three years, we hope and we will put in place business models to get villagers organized to produce the agents. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Code from The Mandarin. Hello, Melissa Code from The Mandarin. It seems these days a lot of talks I go to talk about polycrises, um, and certainly you touched on a number of those. Um, so if we could get both philosophical and pragmatic. Um, you mentioned some system problems, ad hocery, um, brilliant innovation that's patchy, sluggish, um, myopic approach. If now is the time to be courageous rather than hopeful about these things, and someone as brilliant as you who's worked in these ecosystems for as long as you have <laughs> hasn't been able to transform the system, what radical system transformation do we need? If you could wave a magic wand and remove 
bureaucratic level X or give more powers to agency Y, what, what would it take to shift from hope to courage? Um, well, I, I'm, there aren't any magic wands or magic bullets in this, in this space. Um, I'm a counsellor on the ACT division of IPA, the Institute of Public Administration, and I know, talking to senior colleagues across uh, the public sector, we're all thinking about how we build stronger institutions that are able to uh, have a very clear sight, line of sight on the national interest and the public interest uh, and, and be effective over the, the long run. How we look after the knowledge, how we try and make sure that we're not a forgetting system, how we try and work more effectively across agency and, and uh, uh, departmental boundaries. They're all, they're all tools of statecraft too. And we need to really refocus on those things to build, in my view, more effective institutions. The university's accord between the government and the university sector is a good opportunity for a reset. In our space, I'd love to see Australia have a much more effective overarching alumni program. Through Australia Awards, we've trained tens of thousands of people across the region but we don't have a, a, a proper, ACR does, but the broader alumni program doesn't. The data's not organised, we don't know where everybody is, uh, an ambassador can't click a button and say, who do we know in such and such an organisation or in such and such a lobby group? So we could be far more effective if we joined up what we already know. And I think it's that sort of patient, uh, systematic institution rebuilding that we need to do. And in our space of environment, uh, yesterday I was in Brisbane at the, the symposium of the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network. The incredibly cool tools these days for monitoring wildlife or um, what's happening in streams. In my own, where my farm is at Hamilton, you can log onto the CMA website and, and go into a webcam for platypus watch in the creek in Hamilton in real time for free. That would have cost thousands of dollars when I was at you. Well, it wouldn't have been possible 20 or 30 years ago. So the ability for us to have a system that's smart and that is more agile is actually technically there. It's about us getting our, our institutional framework right. And that's where I think there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of really exciting careers to be had. Uh, there's brilliant people coming into the Australian public service and, uh, and obviously at a community level, and we need to join things up. As I said, I'd like to look at what happened in Lismore and actually design things around that, rather than saying, let's build a bigger and better cavalry. The cavalry won't come over the hill. So, so on that, because you sort of touched on it in your speech but didn't speak to it enough in my mind, addressing this sort of time of chaos is gendered. Um, when you talk about empowering grassroots communities as sort of an antidote to the systems failure that we've seen over successive decades, what role do you think um, empowering women leaders in local communities to reckon with those issues has? Is it important in your mind? Absolutely essential. Um, and, uh, and particularly down at that level, one of the most significant things about land care in the very early days was that this was a safe space for women to lead in rural communities. And many land care groups were led by women. And of course, they're much better organisers. And um, i would learned this very early on as a young extension officer doing farm trees. Uh, I was out there to give advice to farmers. I always made sure that the female partner in the farming partnership was there because she would write things down and the bloke would forget. Um, and species lists and all that sort of stuff. I quickly learned that if the female um, farmer was on board, it would happen. And if the bloke was on board, it might happen. Uh, and it's the same in every, uh, in every grassroots community organisation. When I arrived at ACR, uh, two out of the top 18 people in the organisation were women, and within Two years, it was 14 out of 18. 
and that completely transformed the organisation. Um, so, so yes, um, the sooner we can just get gender um, uh, as as a non-issue and and um, and uh, have women routinely leading things, and it's fantastic that Wendy's now the the new CEO of ACR, uh, the better. Thanks, Nick Stewart. Thanks very much. After a speech like that, I'm sure there are a lot of people up on the hill who will be very pleased that you're leaving. And <laughs> many will wonder why you didn't go earlier. <laughs> but um, uh, as a journalist, I've been trained to focus on things like whether CPI is up by 0.8 rather than uh, 1%, because each little bit makes a difference to interest rates, which are by far the most important thing in Australia at the moment. What you are talking about is obviously something that's, that's quite different. You're looking at, at our real productivity rather than measurements of the, that may be very up and down by little bits. We've seen overnight that there's been uh, talk that the Gulf Stream is going to actually collapse. What is the situation for agriculture, which is the most important part of the world economy? Because without agriculture, we, we, we can't eat. We, we don't survive. What, what, is, what should Australia be doing? What is, how do we get the real focus back on the most important thing in the world at the moment? Wow. Um, look, the, Gulf Stra the, the situation with ocean temperatures uh, and the, the drivers of ocean circulation, of which the Gulf Stream is one, manifestation is incredibly worrying. Uh, I don't think even the experts in that field are able to project with any, uh, w with even a reasonable degree of certainty what the particular geographies, are what the impact is going to be for certain geographies. Um, I've been to Iceland a number of times, uh, actually helped them introduce a national land care program, or even in places like Wales, Without the Gulf Stream, they wouldn't be able to grow food there. So if it, other than in glass houses with completely artificial situations. So um, the implications are enormous, but we're already seeing it. Wheat yields in Southern Europe are going to be down dramatically this season because of the heat wave that they're going through right now. So we're already seeing very uh, significant impacts. That's not worrying about what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, but the differential geographic footprint of the changes in ocean circulation for food production. I think that's, there'll be a number of research projects on that right now, but I don't feel qualified to, to give you a picture. What Australia can do is, um, is make sure we're at the cutting edge of climate change science, which we have been at various times, uh, and we have the capability to be so, and in particular, Australia has absolutely been a leader in understanding the implications of climate variability for farming systems. We were the first country that really got a handle on ENSO, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and what that means for uh, sowing times and, uh, and likely seasonal conditions. We were the first country to develop sophisticated seasonal forecasting tools targeted for farmers. So we actually have been a leader in this space, and I think that's what the whole thrust of my talk is, that we should aim to be so uh, even more in the future. Because I'm a journalist, I can't remember 2020 or, or the heat mm -hmm. and, and the, the fires. Um, uh, I'm focused on the immediate. What is a way of changing our dialogue, our debate, so that we can actually re retain institutional memory of these sort of issues that, that are going to recur year after year? Um, look, I hesitate to give lectures to the media, Nick, uh, <laughs> but uh, in my view, it's part of the problem. Um, and that's why I think an antidote is empowering people to, at a local grassroots community level with the amazing tools we have now for them to understand what's happening in their own places and for them to own their own data and for them to feel some control about what they can do. Because if we don't give people tools to feel some level of agency, then 
Uh, it all just seems too hard. Tim Lester is a committee member at the National Rural Press Club. Thanks, Kath. Uh, yeah, so Tim Lester, I'm Vice President of the National Rural Press Club. So on behalf of the club, of our members and our sponsors, thanks, Andrew, very much. That was an awesome presentation. And to the room, please go to our website, join up. If you like what you're doing, what we're doing here, become a member, join the committee, corporate and individual memberships are available. Not bad, is it? <laughs> on a personal note, I wanted to thank you as well because to coin or borrow a phrase, when the rainbow kicked me in the arse, it was working with Land and Water Australia has been a highlight of my career. And I, I see a number of friends and colleagues from that organisation in the room, and I'm sure we all pass on our thanks to you for your leadership. Now I work in the forestry industry. So this is quite a contested space. And I, but I was thinking, what's your reflection on the current state of the relationship between the environmental and agricultural movements? Because if we're going to answer these big questions, you cannot avoid productive landscape management. I, I don't think, in my view. So having seen the growth of the land care movement and the way that environment and ag came together to work in that space, where do you think we currently are and what might we need to do if that needs to be improved? Thanks, Tim. Um, here I'm getting right out of my lane uh, with my current role, but I am actually a professional forester. Um, and I resigned in protest from the Institute of Forestry 30-odd um, years ago because they couldn't get out of the bunker in their fight with the Greenies. Uh, I found Landcare a much, more, uh, a much better place to be operating because we had environment and conservation and production coming together and, and figuring it out. In forestry, maybe because of the corporate structure of the industry, or maybe because a lot of the professional foresters were either, either employed by large corporations or by state governments, and one lot couldn't say anything and the other lot couldn't say anything for different reasons. We never had the debate that we should have had about what does forestry, what should forestry look like in Australia across all tenures. Our approach to farm forestry, in my view, is one of the biggest frustrations of my professional career. Uh, so we had the disgraceful MIS schemes, uh, which butchered a lot of lands, uh, landscapes. Two of the demonstration farms that I worked on in the Potter Farmland Plan, the MIS companies came in and literally put a bulldozer through all our environmental revegetation so they could plant monocultures of bluegum dug a big hole with the bulldozer and pushed the fences and the trees into them. So um, we've had some very unfortunate episodes. In my view, it's ludicrous that Australia isn't at least self-sufficient in forest products. We absolutely should be growing our own timber and we should be doing that on a combination of public and private land and it should be going into fabulous uh, products for sustainable housing and we need to change our carbon accounting rules so that if you harvest timber and put it into a house like I've just built, that'll be there for hundreds of years. It's far more secure carbon than the carbon that's still out in the landscape. But unfortunately, we've got a new farm forestry scheme that I don't think I'll be eligible for because you have to plant a minimum of 20 hectares. I haven't got 50 spare acres to chuck in in one go. I'd like to integrate something for wildlife habitat and erosion control and aesthetics and so on in a way that fits my farm. Won't fit the current scheme. So we're a long way from having... I'm distressed about what's happening with forestry. It's a shame what's happened in Victoria. I think a, a 2030 strategy was possibly doable, but doing it by the end of this year. Who's going to drive the bulldozers in the next big fires? So there's a lot of things that we've got. Forestry is probably in worse shape than just about any other area that I can think of, and that's where we really need a reset. And I think the lessons from Landcare could absolutely inform a completely new approach to Australia should be growing a hell of a lot more trees than it is now. We've got the space. It's ludicrous for us to be importing forest products. Although if you go to Bunnings or Ikea in this town right now, the outdoor furniture will be acacia coming from ACR projects in Vietnam. 
<laughs> that are that are delivering really good livelihoods for smallholders. Two thirds of the plantations of uh, acacia and eucalypt in Vietnam are on smallholder farms on war damaged lands. And I was talking to one farmer and he said, I used not to be able to afford to send my kids to school. Now my son's going to university and guess what he's doing? Forestry. <laughs> Fantastic eucalypt and acacia cloning happening in Hanoi. It's actually been better shaped there than it is here. Uh, ACR, and this is my final point, ACR is the biggest funder of forestry research in Australia to fund Australians to work overseas. So we've got the whole architecture completely wrong. Andrew Campbell, we'll let you make one more point. Uh, with two more days left in the role, we do have one question to come from Sam Coggins, who's a PhD student at ANU. How did he get in? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to work that out as well, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, I'm part of, yeah. Um, I felt pretty anxious um, having to ask a question, but then also hearing about the, the climate change and food security challenges that we're facing, being reminded of those, um, but then felt really hopeful and almost a bit excited hearing about the, the fish ladders in the Mekong and the um, full armyworm thing in Zambia and the, the happy cedar in India, all facilitated by ACR. Um, are there any other ACR projects that you're particularly proud of and would like more Australians to be more aware of? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole book full of them, Sam, uh, and get on the ACR website. There's heaps of uh, success stories, and, and yes, there are, there are way too many for me to, it's like ask me to name my favourite kids. So, so um, yes, there are many. Beautifully done. Professor Campbell, thank you so much for your time today. I can't wait to go and tune in to the platypuses in the Hamilton River. Um, a gift for you today is a membership. I know you're off to Paris, um, but when you come home... No, Montpellier. Oh, forgive me. Um, but when you're in Canberra, you've now got access to the car park. So thank you once again for your address today.